Hallelujah, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. of the Apostles, the third chapter, beginning at the twelfth verse. Peter addressed the people, You Israelites, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us, as though by our own power or piety we have made this man walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the Holy and Righteous One and asked to have a murderer given to you, and you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses, and by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. And now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, that his Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
reading from the first letter of John, the third chapter, beginning at the first verse. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this, when he is with you, you will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he has revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written, The Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and the repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Everything is simple when you don't know a thing about it. 
That was my problem, looking down the row of vines. Because of my naivete, it all seemed so simple. But it was also because of this lack of knowledge that the vineyard gave me so little information. What were just some vines to me were to my grandfather a veritable cornucopia of agrarian information. And in many ways, this same dynamic applies to being a Christian. The less we know about God, the less likely we are to see his handiwork on this earth. In the letter we have from John today, we read, the reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this, when he is revealed, we will be like him. For we will see him as he is, and all who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure. Now what exactly is meant by the world not knowing us is not perfectly clear. But the lack of ability to know is a direct result of the world's lack of knowledge of God. John then goes on to explain how those with knowledge of God will be transformed into God's likeness. The basic equation of it is that if you know God, you will be changed, whereas if you don't, well, you will not then. In fact, you won't even be aware of the fact that you can or need to be changed. Now, in movies and television, there's something known as shot length. Shot length is the amount of time a camera stays in one place focused on the same area. In practicality, what this means is that if you're watching a movie or television show and there is an image of a car driving on a road followed by an image of the person inside the car, these are two different shots. The length, then, is how long you're watching the car driving before it switches to the image of the person inside the car, and then how long you see the image of the person inside the car before the next scene, and so on. Well, someone who was very bored did some research and found that in 1930, the average length of a shot was around 12 seconds, meaning you would watch the car for 12 seconds before you saw the image of the person inside the car. However, by 2014, that number had been reduced to, from 12 to 2.5 seconds, about an 80% decline. Now, if you equate shot length to our attention span, which I realize might be a little dubious, but if you do, it means that our attention span has also dropped by 80% in those 84 years, or about 1% a year. I bring this up to point out how if John thought that people in his day and age had a problem knowing God, then we probably have a much bigger problem now, because I'm pretty sure you can't come to know God in 2.5 seconds. If you don't believe me, listen to this report. Quote, Americans' membership in houses of worship continued to decline last year, dropping below 50% for the first time in Gallup's eight-year decade trend. Gallup reported in a Monday post, quote, U.S. church membership was 73% when Gallup first measured it in 1937 and remained near 70% for the next six decades before beginning a steady decline around the turn of the 21st century. Now, I'm not saying that you can line up declining attention spans and declining church attendance and say that one caused the other. After all, correlation is not causation. Because following that hermeneutic, you could also blame the decline in church attendance on the increase in movies starring Leonardo DiCaprio. Something certainly bad, but not necessarily responsible for everything wrong in the world. But I do, however, think that our lack of ability to focus on things for a long period of time plays a role in declining church attendance. Because knowing God requires some concentration. For as the psalmist famously says, be still and know that I am God. If we find 2.5 seconds of focus to be a burden we cannot bear, how are we going to be still long enough to hear from God? The Jesuit poet Gerard Manley Hopkins in his sonnet God's Grandeur says, The world is charged with the grandeur of God. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. To Hopkins' mind, we should see God everywhere. And it should be so overwhelming that we can't miss it. I mean, he literally equates God's grandeur to a shiny object. But so many people do miss God. And I think the reason so many people do this is that they are like me, looking down the rows of grapevines. They see nothing because they have not taken the time to grow and understand what it is that they're looking at. 
When I was in business school, I remember studying the case of New Coke. If you remember this fiasco, it all began in April of 1985, when to great fanfare, Coca-Cola rolled out a sweeter version of Coca-Cola called New Coke. It was developed largely in response to the fact that in blind taste tests, people preferred the taste of Pepsi to Coke, Pepsi being the sweeter beverage. However, New Coke's introduction did not go so well, and within three months, Old Coke was brought back under the name Coca-Cola Classic. So what went wrong? Why, if people seem to prefer sweeter drinks, did the sweeter version of Coke fail? Well, later research discovered that in blind taste tests, the sweeter product always won. But that's not that does not necessarily mean that the sweeter product was the product people actually wanted when they went shopping for soda. The artificial world of the taste test failed to predict real-world results. I think we have something in the same phenomenon. If you put church next to most anything these days, the sweeter product is going to win. And by sweeter, I mean the product that's bigger and louder and fits in better with our very short attention spans. But here's the big difference today between worshiping God and drinking new Coke. People seem to think when worshiping God, they want to live in the world of the permanent taste test, a world where we run towards the louder object and don't want to take the time to see the virtues of the object that is quieter. There is always a two and a half second decision to be made, and so God gets put on hold. But like John says today, we don't recognize the God-filled world in which we live because we have not taken the time to know God and to grow in our love and affection towards him. St. Augustine famously said, I believe in order to understand. What he meant was, you have to start by believing and worshiping God, and after that, your understanding will grow and thrive. We need to make a conscious decision to leave the world of the taste test, the world that is always getting louder and faster to grab our attention, so that we may go to the place where true meaning is to be found. We need to eliminate the distractions so that we may hear from the God of the universe, so that as John says today, we may be like him, for we will see him as he is. Amen. We believe in one God.
bringing all who govern and all authority in the nations of the world, that, they may, that there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace and do your will in all that we undertake, that our works may find faith in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble, that they may be delivered from their distress. Give to the departed eternal rest, that light perpetual shine upon them. Praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in your heaven. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. Almighty God, to whom our needs are known before we ask, help us to ask only what accords with your will. And those good things which we dare not or in our blindness cannot ask. Grant us for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. <laughs> Most merciful God, we, we confess, confess that we have sinned against, against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we want to repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Now may the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Peace. Peace. Ascribe to the Lord the honor to his name, bring offerings, and come into his courts. <laughs>
Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let's give thanks to the Lord our God. It is his right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and good and joyful to sing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father, Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. But chiefly we bow to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. For he is the true Paschal Lamb who was sacrificed for us and has taken away the sin of the world. By his death, he has destroyed death, and by his rising life again, he has won for us everlasting life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory. Now, as 
gifts of God to the people of God.